Hey guys, welcome back to History of Original Success. And I'm here today with a video that I hope will um, interest you and really help you understand the Highland Clearances. Now, this was supposed to be a video all about the Highland Clearances, um, which is obviously in the course. However, I was preparing this video and I was using and having a glance at the textbook and using that as one of my sources to make sure this is really, really aligned to the course. And I just felt that the Jacobites and the Jacobite rising was really briefly touched upon. And it bothered me because how can you understand the Highland clearances without really understanding the Jacobite rising? Because it is the predominantly main cause of why there was so much trouble, um, turmoil and um, difficulty and persecution in Scotland. Plus, it's just such an interesting topic. I think it's highly relevant that we understand about the difficulties that were faced much closer to home. Um, this is a very, very important area and topic to understand, to understand kind of what's going on today in Great Britain, the idea of Scottish independence and things like that. It's very romanticized, particularly by kind of TV shows these days you know, the idea of a group of people who, who quite literally go to war against England um, armed with swords and muskets just to fight for their independence and their autonomy and to be able to practice the religion they want and to not be persecuted in the way that they have been. I think the way that the English crown treated Scottish people at this time was appalling. Um, it made life incredibly difficult for Scottish people. And the Jacobite rising was really an expression of all of that. You know, we are fed up, we are frustrated, and we are done essentially with being treated like this. And they came together to fight for Scotland. And, you know, they found a claimant who could represent them in, in the Stuart King, which I'll get to, in, I'll get to you later. But understanding all of that is absolutely paramount to understanding the Highland clearances and why England treated Scotland so harshly after these risings. Um, if you want to get a grade nine, you really do need to have that good holistic understanding of all of this. Um, so I highly recommend that you watch this and you understand that just to get that background context um, of, why, of why the Highland clearances happened, okay? so. Here we go. Who actually were the Jacobites? Well, most Highlanders were Jacobites and Jacobites as a name kind of refers to that, the idea of the support for the Stuart cause and James. However, being a Jacobite was so much more than just wanting a different king on the throne. And I'm gonna go through this in a more simplistic and brief sense. And then after that, I'm going to go through it far more detailed with lots of visual support behind me because it is quite complicated and I wanted to make sure it was easy to understand. So listen to this first bit and then watch the fuller explanation. Now, the last Stuart monarch in England and Scotland was Queen Anne and Queen Anne died in 1714. Now, um, she died without child. She was married to George, um, uh, another man. There's lots of Georges, by the way, so be, be careful about that. So she married a man called George, who was from Denmark. They didn't have a child of their own. So when she died, um, her cousin, George of Hanover, who was kind of her closest, he was still distant. I think he was a second cousin, but he was the closest Protestant relative. George was invited to come and be king. Now, by being king, by coming over to be king, he had to sign away many of the rights of the monarch and parliament grew significantly at this point, which is partly why English parliament today, particularly in the last um, you know, 100, 200 years, the monarchy had less and less rights when you compare them to monarchies around the world, um, which is quite interesting. Anyway, so George was invited to come over. Now, George obviously had, um, no Stuart blood, he was not a direct descendant, he was not the rightful king as our kind of monarchy inheritance laws work, and he was also a Protestant. Now you add to this um, the fact that the Scots at the time were being treated very badly, um, 
many, many, many of them were unhappy and felt that they really, really wanted a return to that kind of autonomous rule in Scotland. Uh, we have a situation where people were looking for an alternative and an easy, easy way of, of finding that alternative was looking towards who they saw as the rightful Stuart King, which was not George I. So that's what I'm going to be explaining. So the Jacobites um, wanted a Stuart King. Now, as I said, Anne was the last Stuart monarch on the joint English and Scottish throne. She followed her older sister, Mary II. Now, Mary II and Anne were both the daughters of James II of England, who was James VII of Scotland. James was the younger brother of Charles II. Charles II was the restored monarch and the son of Charles I. So if you think slightly about your um, English monarch history, I'm going to go backwards. Elizabeth I was the last Tudor queen. She died without any children. And so when she died, the throne passed to her nephew. So that was Mary, Queen of Scots, um, famous Mary who, who was executed by Elizabeth. Mary, Queen of Scots' son. And so Mary, Queen of Scots' son, who was already the King of Scotland, became the first King of Scotland and England, and he became James I of England. Now, James I's son was Charles I, and Charles I experienced a huge amount of difficulty on the, in, on the English throne. I'm not gonna go into it um, because it's not relevant to this, but during Charles I's reign, we obviously have the, the Civil War, and that ended in Charles I's execution, and a period of time we call an interregnum or a commonwealth where Oliver Cromwell ruled England, not as king, but as kind of a leader instead. Now, after Oliver Cromwell's death, the English parliament and the English people decided that they wanted a return to that Stuart monarchy. And they invited Charles II, Charles I's son, to return to England. And this is an event we call the restoration, so the restoration of the monarchy. Now, because of restoration, Charles II actually signs away many of the what we call prerogative rights of the monarch. Now, prerogative means the rights that you have because of who you are. So when we talk about prerogative rights with a monarch, we talk about the rights that only they have, the things only they are allowed to do. Now, under Elizabeth I, which is a good example, she stated very openly that religion, her marriage, and her succession were her prerogative rights and she would not listen and nobody else had the right to decide any of those three areas. By the time of Charles II and the restoration, quite a few of those rights have been lost. He signed them away in a document called the Declaration of Breda. Um, and so Parliament by this point are far more powerful, which is why Parliament are in a position to dictate um, and to make kind of far more overwhelmingly powerful decisions about religion. Now, both Charles II and Charles I, even though publicly stating they're Protestant, act in many ways that might suggest that they actually are Catholic. And Parliament by this point are very strongly Protestant. Um, by Charles II, they are in particular Anglican um, and they don't want well, either a Catholic monarch, absolutely not, that would not suit their purposes at all. Um, and secondly, they don't want to go back to that kind of tumultuous, chaotic period of time we saw previously where we had the monarch consistently changing the religion. They want a Protestant king or queen who is essentially going to do what they say. Now, the real issue is because James, um, James II, Charles II's brother publicly declares that he is a Catholic. Now he's kind of forced into this um, because of a thing called the Test Act, where um, Parliament essentially say that you have to publicly declare that you are a Protestant and you're not allowed to hold office if you're not Protestant. And because of this, James publicly comes out and states that he's actually a Catholic. 
And this is very, very difficult for Parliament because they don't want the throne to pass to James after Charles's death, because that would mean they had a Catholic monarch again. Now, James um, has been married to a lady called Anne Hyde. Now, Anne Hyde is the daughter of an English nobleman, and together they have two surviving daughters, Mary and Anne. Now, Mary and Anne have actually been brought up as Anglican, so they are Protestant. Obviously, a far better choice for Parliament than James himself, who's come out to say that he's Catholic. Now, in addition to this, um, James does actually have a surviving son. When Anne dies, he remarries and he remarries a lady called Mary of Moderna, and together they have a son also called James. However, this son, this child is brought up as a Catholic. So as you can see, technically, um, if we follow the inheritance rules in England, James should inherit the throne after Charles and after James, his youngest child, another James, should inherit the throne after him. But that poses a problem because we have two um, monarchs who are Catholic. So Parliament don't really want that to happen. So they look for a solution. What could we do? And remember, by this point, Parliament are relatively powerful. So it is within their power to find a solution and find a way around this. And the thing they come upon is this idea of the glorious revolution. And what happens in the glorious revolution is that the Stuart King is deposed. Deposed means got rid of, the throne is taken from him, and him, his wife, and his son go into exile in Europe. Instead, they give the throne to Mary, his oldest daughter, who is a Protestant and is also married to a Protestant William of Orange. When Mary dies, the throne passed to William, who is also a Protestant. Um, and after, sorry, I'll get there in a second. Um, I've lost all train of thought. Here we go, James. After James's death, so James II, who's been deposed, so he's no longer James II of England, he's just James, who's living in Europe, he dies in 1701, while William of Orange is on the throne. On his death, his son, James Stuart, declares that he is the rightful king of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And by doing so, he is announcing um, a claim to the throne, which essentially announces, if there's a group of people that are gonna support me, I am going to take this throne back. It's mine. It's not William's, it's mine. So this creates the situation for which a disgruntled and unhappy group of people who are looking for a Stuart king, who are also looking for a king that would tolerate Catholicism because the Highlanders predominantly followed um, Catholicism. And we have two groups of people who, who can quite clearly come together here to suit each other's purposes. Now, after William of Orange's death a year later in 1702, Mary's younger sister, Anne, takes the throne. Now, Anne um, marries another George, George of Denmark. However, they don't have any children. So when Anne dies, her distant cousin, George of Hanover, is invited to take the throne. Now, by taking the throne, he signs away even more of those prerogative rights of the monarch, which he does. And we have George of Hanover, who becomes George I of England. Now, this point really is the moment where James Stuart can kind of cat capitalise on this political situation. There are many people in England who would prefer a return to the Stuart King. There are some noblemen in England who, who would prefer a return to the Stuart King. People, quite understandably, um, perhaps don't like the idea of having, having this foreign monarch who doesn't really have any direct descendant or isn't a direct descendant, doesn't really have any direct bloodline um, to the old kings. He is a Protestant. We still have Catholics in England who would re prefer a return to a Catholic monarch. Um, and in addition, we obviously have these Scottish Highlanders who are looking for change, looking for somebody who's going to offer them tolerance um, and autonomy. And in that, they unite with James Stewart and we see the creation of this group, the Jacobites. Now, in 1715, the Scottish Highlanders support James Stewart 
um, who is known as the old pretender in the first Jacobite rising against George I. Now this rising is unsuccessful. It's crushed by George who brings over many, many troops from Hanover up to Scotland and they managed to crush the rising quite, quite easily. However, this um, ignites both even greater repression in Scotland, even greater English and Anglican control. It leads to that idea of trying to kind of crush the Gaelic culture, the Gaelic way of life and gain complete Anglicized control over Scotland. If you've watched my video on the Ulster plantations, very similar to that kind of idea of we need to crush the spirit from this country, from these people in order to gain control over this place. Um, in addition to that, George of Hanover dies and his son, George II, inherits the throne. So again, we have a monarch with no real direct line to the English kings, um, not somebody who's going to allow for tolerance of Catholicism, nor is he going to entertain the idea of Scottish autonomy. James Stuart also dies and his son, Charles Edward Stuart, takes over the pretender crown as such, the pretender claim to the throne. And this is really where we see that famous rising, the 1745 Second Jacobite Rising, who are going against George II and who are supportive of Charles Edward Stuart or Bonnie Prince Charlie, as he's known, to be the rightful king of England and Scotland. Now, this leads me to kind of that final point that, yes, the Scots, the Highlanders wanted um, a Stuart King back on the throne, but the Jacobite rising is about much, much more than just changing the monarch. You know, it's really about gaining greater power, greater autonomy over their country, and particularly inspired by the kind of very harsh repression that is instituted in Scotland. Um, autonomy, for example, is something that, that Charles Edward Stuart and the Highlanders don't agree over. Um, one of the reasons you might say that the, the Jacobite claim really never is particularly viable because they never really have a joint set of aims. Um, however, their aims really, as I said, are kind of um, autonomy, tolerance, and, and a return to that Stuart line. Now, that's the Jacobites. That's what they wanted. That's why they were unhappy with the political situation. Um, in my next video, I'm going to talk about the 1745 Rising, particularly the Battle of Culloden, which is the very famous one, you know, the real kind of moment of, um, of that Jacobite claim, that Jacobite Rising, and what happens there. And then we'll talk about what the Highland clearances were and the impact they had on Scotland. If you like this video, please do like and subscribe. Um, it's really helpful, these videos do take quite a long time for me to make, so I don't want to be making them if nobody cares. Um, so it really reassures me as such to know that they're helpful for you. Um, as I said, I believe that this is really important information to understand holistically um, the Highland clearances and to gain a better idea of this course, this idea of migration, and the idea of England as this kind of colonial power at this time um, I think it's very important you know this. So hopefully it was helpful to you and I look forward to seeing you next time.